Humor, haunts, and homicide. from Humor, Haunts, and Homicide. And I'm your co-host, Renee, from Humor, Haunts, and Homicide as well. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and thank you for that. Thank you just for being you. You know, thank you for being you. I appreciate you thanking me for thanking yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I, it didn't work out. No, but I would like to welcome everybody to episode eight. The big eight. Um, The great eight. The great eight. That <laughs> seems big. Yeah, eight it, is great, it's, you know. It's great. Yeah. So um, what's been going What's new? Oh gosh, for me, right, the Game of Thrones finale. I was you did just dying it. To you finally I did finally it. did it. I don't really know why people hated it. Same. I don't. I don't. Daenerys deserved her death. She went fucking crazy out of nowhere. I mean, I understand it's in her genes. She's the Mad King's daughter, but you know, she's fucking. She deserved to so die. She went loco. Yeah, <laughs> she went fucking nuts and authoritative as fuck dictatorship it was just yeah Jon Snow did the right thing and I thought it wrapped up everyone's story nicely Sansa was queen of the north and Bran taking I didn't really agree with that part that was a little that was weird um okay so I know I had said to you that when you finished I was gonna tell you that there was like a I couldn't give it away but that there was a particular person's story that I would like a spinoff on Arya yes Uh, yeah I kind of called that before I knew that okay Yes. Yeah, but yes, I agree. Because she's imagine, not... it would be, like, they could do so much with... Going to the West where it's not on the map and she's going to that journey. Yeah, fuck yeah. yeah. Give it a show. I think it'd be great. However, the actress right now, I don't know. She's a little looking, a little crazy. She's actually not. Not as bad? No. Okay. No, I follow her on Instagram. I'm Instagram. That's good. Yeah, she's, she's fine. Okay. She's good. She's going through a little thing for a minute. I think she's okay. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. <laughs> she was having a little worried that way. Yeah. Right well, you were getting wrapped up on Game of Thrones. Um, I was watching let me guess <laughs> let me take a fucking stab in the dark before you even release it the eras tour on disney plus it came out oh my god did it ever yeah wow. um so i've watched it probably three times since it came out um and why not it brings me joy it does and i'm fine with that yeah, so... how many times total do you think you've seen the eras tour okay so i guess now it would be seven because i did know eight i saw it um Four times in the theater. That's literally a whole day's worth of hours. 24, isn't it a three hour movie? Perhaps. So eight times three. I'm just doing the math. You know. That's fine. Yeah. So I, I saw it four times in a the theater. I saw it once when I rented it on Amazon, which would be five, three times now on yeah. Disney Plus. And you're not going to stop. I absolutely won't stop. Um, she doesn't go back on tour until May. So what, oh, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> I have a couple shows I could recommend that you kind of semi committed. Maybe, maybe we'll fill a few of those, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll do that. In the next episode. Ooh. I'm really adopting this you thing. Did. You did. You brought it back. I like it. And we're we're going to keep it back too. Uh, you have a fun little trip coming up. I do. It is confirmed. I know I mentioned trying to go to the Marshall house, but it is now locked down ready to go rooms are booked Booked. charged to my account non-refundable it's happening so this time are you going to try and maybe capture some footage or something like that like i'm wondering if i should just because you know with the iphone you could just set your phone to record yeah i wonder if i could do it all night you could and just have a recording going and then in the morning kind of go through it i mean that's eight hours of footage to go through but you know, I can see the spikes and if there's any conversations. Yeah. I was thinking too, um, I mean, I don't know for sure, but maybe check on Amazon for like the EMF thing. Like they might have something like that on. They're like probably a, pretty cheap. I can only imagine. They were $10 to rent. That's it? Like, or maybe five. It was like an extra five or $10 to rent at like when we did the lighthouse thing. Okay. So I imagine it can't be outrageous. You don't need like, I mean, you're not like on taps or anything. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need like the state of the art or anything the ghostbusters just, gear yeah just like something that would be cool i'm down take some photos i've got i got about a month to figure that out so i will take you up on those recommendations i'm trying to think though like we're gonna end up doing another ghost tour we're gonna go through st augustine like i mentioned prior in the last episode are you doing charleston we're gonna do charleston i think we're gonna be able to go through st augustine and do the lighthouse tour and then we're going to kind of 
skip past Savannah because it's only a few hours from there. Get Charleston in that day as well. Okay. And then turn around for Savannah at night. Do a ghost tour. Go out to dinner. Explore the town that way. So basically, we need to get to St. Augustine early in the morning. Get through that. Get right to Charleston. Turn around to Savannah and go home the next day. Okay. Wow. It's going to be great. So it's going to It's a whirlwind. It's it is a whirlwind, whirlwind jam-packed, haunted good time. Not me. I won't be doing it, unfortunately. Too bad, so sad, but you are <laughs> always invited. We're doing it again. Okay, I will be watching um, my nephew doggies. Yes, <laughs> in our home with our cult friends behind us. I can't wait for you, that. You have the alarm. You know where my gun is. You're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of knives. You're ready to, yeah, be safe. All right, so how's work going? Work is going job. great. I, uh, it's not a whole lot really happening. Just a big week of online training. However... The vibe is great. Everyone's been fantastic and very welcoming, and the company is great, and I'm really excited. So stay tuned until I figure out where they're going to place me and where I can move to get the hell out of this house. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's really nothing to speak about about my work except that I um, I like my job, so it's just... <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> except my car did get a boo-boo. I did get into an accident, Ooh. Um, and unfortunately... Uh, my Betty is in the shop right now. So what exactly happened to the front? Well, um, I didn't stop in time and rear-ended somebody. And of course, it was a brand new 2024, you know, because, you know, why would I, why wouldn't I just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was the nicest woman on the planet. Everything turned out fine. Did you guys we, hug? No. Did we you didn't, cry? No, we didn't hug, but she... No. No. <laughs> I just figured that that would have happened. I do cry a lot, but I didn't cry. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Betty is in the shop. She's in very good hands because I do work at a body shop. Um, I didn't mention that, but... So she's in very good hands, and I hopefully will have her back soon because I miss her. So, yeah. Well... I hope that Betty is reunited with you as soon as possible and yeah. you guys can end that turmoil. It is. It's been a sad, it's, it's been a sad time. It's been a very sad moment in you and Betty's journey. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that's coming to an end. Let's see what else is new. Well, are you watching anything new now that Game of Thrones is over? Well, I've dabbled a little bit into Deal or No Deal Island with, what's his name? Joe Manganiello from True Blood. Oh. I'll seed. Oh. I know my husband's going to hear me, mainly because he's right behind he me. He is. But <laughs> <laughs> he is, he's a hot man. If he, anyone says differently. Then you're wrong. You're wrong. And you're, <laughs> you're lying. lying. You're, lying. you're lying. lying. I mean. What do you have to say about that, babe? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's cool with it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, let's be honest. Let's just be there. Mm. Be in that same place of <laughs> hot, hottesty. <laughs> like that? Was that fun? Hottesty. That's right. Let's see. Uh, other than that, I recently went to the beach. Okay. We did a little bit of mind escape. It was like midnight. Sometimes I do this shit. I just get in my head. I want to go and run away for a minute. So get the beach bag and sit at the beach, lay there, and just take all the ocean sounds and waves. It's kind of my thing. Well, um, I will say that I love the idea of being completely alone. Yes. The beach is not my favorite place, if I'm being honest. I know this could be like you're living for. I know it's, it's the weirdest thing ever. Here, it's not. It's not the beach itself. It is. I don't really like love the sand, and I don't. I really the water is is a big no for me because I am, um, deathly afraid of sharks. I was gonna say irrationally, but I don't think it's irrational to be honest. <laughs> I don't think you it's don't irrational. Like to be chomped? What? I don't even like being in an aquarium. It makes me nervous. What? You know the aquariums where they're like the sharks swim above you, like and you kind of have to go through a tunnel. Yeah, that is the that is so panic inducing. I can't even describe it. Like I can't even describe it. Um, but now what I but back to the beach. What I do love about the beach is when you can stay like at a hotel that's on a beach, okay, and then you're either like on your balcony and you look at the beach that way, or at the pool of the hotel, and then I can see the beach, but I'm in the pool. There's but no sand. What if you're in a... I will play in the sand. I'm not saying I won't play in the sand. Ever. I don't like... I understand but, wet sand and feet. Those are not things yeah. I jive with well. I do better if I'm staying at the beach rather than having to get in a car after... Because I think that's part of why I don't like the beach. Is the feeling of the beach when you're then driving from the beach to your house. But what if you planned it out where you had like a towel to wipe the sand off you before you get in your car? I'm going to, you know what, let's, I'll give it a, I'll give it a try. Cause that's where I'll go on. A, you know what? I'll go on a midnight. 
I'll go on a midnight beach. That's all I'm saying. Live a little. Trip you know, you. just like walk <laughs> walk the beach and just yeah, just let all those things out. Okay. You know, all give right. it a good cry. Okay. Or you don't have to. Why do you want me to cry so bad? I just think crying's healthy. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> We all can cry a little more. I do it a lot. That's fine. You just let them out, baby. Okay. Let them out. All right. Wow. What else are you doing? Oh, gosh. Oh, you joined the gym. I did, and I might change my gym. So, Planet Fitness is where we're currently at, but I'm also understanding there's a new gym bios called E. I think it's EOS. EOS. And it looks awesome. It does. It's very close. There's not a whole lot of them around, but it's got yoga and Zumba and a pool That's and a okay. sauna and massage chairs, and it's 24 hours. And who doesn't want all those things? In the yeah. Gym? So my reservations of joining the gym, you know, a planet fitness and things like that is I am not, I don't, I don't do well, like on a treadmill or with like free weight or any kind of ways, the machines, the ellipticals. I am like definitely like a group fitness class kind of person. And I think it's just because I just get, I get in uninterested. So I need something to keep me interested in going. So this seems really, I mean, like the yoga, I'm super into yoga and Zumba. I've never done really either, but okay. I've always had the interest in Zumba. Yoga, I will try it. I think you'll like it. I'm just not very flexible, which is my Dude, I am not flexible at all. And I love yoga. Like, and let me tell you, I did yoga for like various times, like for a, like big chunks of time. And I never really even got that much more flexible, to be honest. I just, my, I don't think my body... It's flexible. So there are certain poses that are, you know, like maybe I don't like as much, but overall, I, overall, woo! and let me, and I lost, I tell you, I lost my it's bathing. Maybe you're just sweating, right? Like you're just a lot of intense muscle sweating. Well, I mean, to be honest, I don't sweat a lot when I do yoga. I mean, there was, there is hot yoga, which, oh. which was cool. I did okay. like that. Um, but yeah, there was not a lot of sweating. It's just, to be honest, I don't even know half the time how it's making you lose weight, but that's how I lost my baby weight with both kids was yoga and like minimal diet. Well, every Karen that does yoga so, is skinny as shit. See, I mean, so I'm, I'm missing out on the right. You'll even see. I mean, let me tell you, when you go to a yoga class and there's like a, a 65 to 70 year old woman who is, you know, like touching her toes and doing all these poses and you're like dying and struggling that it's a humbling moment it's a humbling moment i'm not gonna lie partly that's why i haven't done it <laughs> but you know what that's what so do it with me and i would that's why it, i'm okay do it with me because you're it's fine i'm not i'm not great but i won't I, do it while the it. whole desperate housewives cast is watching me and judging me but <laughs> alone at least you know what i mean <laughs> but if gabrielle's there she can judge me that's fine oh, gosh she was my favorite favorite who else was there brie i loved brie the redhead is that her name brie Oh yeah! Oh my gosh! Yes, the I redhead. Love her. Yeah, I don't remember her name in real life, but Marsha. Marsha. Mm. Mar yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, loved mm -hmm. her. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to rant all day about we, that. Yeah, we That's a whole other rabbit hole. hole. But for those of you that out, you know, that watch Desperate Housewives, maybe I'll go back and watch that. That was a long time ago. I haven't seen it in so long. Man, that was a good show. Anywho, mm -hmm. I wasn't lying at the time I said this, but I technically am now a liar, and I'm gonna. Mess up. I'm a liar. Pants on I fire. said I didn't wear makeup, but then I looked in the mirror intently this least weekend. <laughs> and let's just say that Walmart delivery got their fair share of my money. What'd I, you get? I may have gotten Neutrogena, Regenerist, or Rapid Wrinkle. It's something along the lines of you gay old bitch, get your life right. Oh, honey. Are, you, the, are yeah. you gauging? I'm gauging. <laughs> I love that word. I hate that now I'm going to have to use it. But I am, Are you having a gauging crisis? I'm, I'm gauging. And for those gays out there, you know what this means. You're right. It's, you're a dinosaur. You're basically dying when you're like almost 40. Okay, cool. And then when it's over 40, it's over. Like it's just over. So my life is over. Cool. That's great. You're not gay. Oh, okay. So it's different. No, I'm not. Definitely it's not. different. You're a breeder. It's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Oh, yeah, that's right. But I think it's time for a little frigidness up in here. A, a cold read, perhaps? A cold read, perhaps. Oh, of a Mad Lib? Oh, a Mad Lib. You have one for me? I do have one for okay, you. Okay, oh my God, let's oh do it. Oh my gosh, it's a surprise, right? Surprise! Okay, this one is called A Lesson in Her Story. Oh, I see what they did there. Get it? Her Get it? story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. From Queen Nefertiti to Princess Bianchua. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> 
A successful drag cunt knows her roots yes, and does. when to touch them up. Ooh. Cleopatra, spicy female pharaoh <laughs> of Ptolemaic Egypt, girlfriend to Julius Caesar, played drunkenly by Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> that's probably I legit. Know, that's probably it probably sounds probably right. was, yeah. right? Marie Antoinette, queen of France with sloshy white hair. Ooh. Her weenus was shaved as she was beheaded. <laughs> what is a weenus? Um, okay, so a weenus is like that, like flappy, like that part of skin on your elbow, like when you stretch out your arm. Oh, that's your weenus. Okay, so her her weenus was shaved. A shaved weenus. Okay, I didn't know. I mean, wow, she had a hairy weenus. Man. That's something. She okay. took care of that. Mm-hmm. Wow. Ava Perone, actress who became first kitty of Argentina. <laughs> Evita inspired a stage musical and a dirt starring Madonna. Oh, yeah. So don't swim for her, Argentina. Don't swim for her, Argentina. The truth is I never let you. Okay. That's all you get. That's all you get, audience. Joan Crawford, film and television actress who won the Academy Award for Best Slut in 1945. <laughs> Her motherly charms were depicted beautifully by Faye Dunaway in the film Mommy Dearest with the famous line, no wire tits. <laughs> Do you, have you ever seen Mommy Dearest? No. No wire hangers ever. That's amazing. She has like a, she's, she goes crazy over wire hangers and it's, it's a great moment. That's anyway. fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'll have to show it to you. Please do. And last but not least, RuPaul. World's first drag super house. Yes. RuPaul skyrocketed to fame in the 1990s with television and recording successes <laughs> at the top of her game. Miss Thang shows no sign of blowing anytime soon. You go, girl. Two snaps up. That was actually three snaps that up. That was three snaps up. So that's fine. I'm going to call her bluff on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, wow. But Mm. listeners, as we promised last episode, we were going to try something new, just, you know, reading bad autocorrect texts. And we're going to do a little role play action. So I'm going to be the person that doesn't know how to get their life together and text right. And Renee is going to be the person that's receiving that message. Uh, Here we go. This one is to Reagan. So I'm assuming Renee is Reagan. Yes. Reneagan. Reneagan. You love that? All right. So Reneagan. What should I buy Sophie for her birthday? Get her some DVDs. She loves movies. Okay. Has she seen Cloudy with a Chance of Man Balls? (laughs) I hope not. She's only six. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Meatballs. Wow. (laughs) Oh, this one is just um, one person texting to Katie. Yeah. Um, So I guess I will be that person. Uh, You have no value. Meant to say clue. I'm sure you have a great value. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, shit. We'll do one more. Okay, one more. Okay. Are you still at Walmart? Yeah, why? Oh, good. I need more OPI nail polish. The color name is Nipple Pink. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously? Oh, my God, no. Tickle Pink. (laughs) (laughs) Thesis phone, I swear. Oh, shit. (laughs) shit. That was another extra, an extra autocorrect. Oh, that was an extra autocorrect. I just wanted to add a little extra pizzazz for it. You know, why not? You know, get my best foot forward there. Now... As we usually do, we're going to spice it up with a little, what What the the Florida? (laughs) And we're going to start by, also, these are also little small snippets because we could go on for days because Florida be crazy. Florida be crazy. This one is Florida Man says, high speed police chase felt like Grand Theft Auto video game. Of course it did. Yeah. Months before it was revealed that the sixth installment of the Grand Theft Auto series will be set in the Sunshine State, this Florida man repeatedly noted that a real, whatever, (laughs) high-speed police chase felt like playing the wildly popular (laughs) video game franchise. According to the Collier County Sheriff's Office, the chase ensued after deputies clocked the 22-year-old driver going 117 miles an hour on I-75. He was accused of ignoring deputies' lights and sirens, topping speeds of 120 before exiting the interstate. On the drive to jail, the driver told the deputy that he felt like he was in a video game of Grand Theft Auto, according to the sheriff's office. So Collier County, you know, like, it's like where Naples is. Where it's like, I would say it's predominantly like older people. Like, br- sir. Can you imagine? Like, calm down. Calm down and over there in Naples. Anyway. 
<laughs> but speaking of Naples, and it is kind of like a jungle. I, I guess it could be in some areas. No, am I thinking something that the keys I maybe? I don't really Anywho. know that it's a jungle in Naples, That's but fine. you know, <laughs> I have clearly never been there. <laughs> Um, this next one is shirtless Florida man found climbing tree like Tarzan. There's a photo uh, attached to this too, and it's pretty. I love it. Let's look, I want to hear it. He doesn't look shirtless it. in this picture, but I guess he is. There's a video playing on the side. Oh, he wait. just like fell from the tree, dude. Oh shit. Okay, read the story. Yeah, just read the that story. That's okay. just good. Sorry okay. about the distraction. <laughs> All right. Police lost sight of this Florida man after a chase, but it wasn't long before they discovered his unusual hiding spot. Four orange police officers found him hiding up in a large oak tree. Body camera video shows officers telling the Florida man to come down from the tree and warning him not to run away or they would send a canine after him. He moved down toward the end of the branch, appearing to run away in the tree, as it's quoted, <laughs> as one of the officers described over his radio. And then another quote, he's literally in a tree right now trying to climb it like Tarzan, an officer said. Shortly before the man was caught on camera, failing to swing from one branch to another. God, a good Florida, you never <sighs> fail. You never fail to give us this gold. Never. <laughs> you want to do one more? Sure. Um, this one is Florida man hides in chest, uses whiteboard to evade deputies. And <laughs> the whiteboard <laughs> on the front of the house, which is also attached to a window, covered in white paint on the actual glass of the window, the whiteboard states that Johnny Yates does not live here. Oh, so yeah, they must take that. That's, that means it must be true. <laughs> this Florida man tried to evade deputies through unconventional means when they attempted to arrest him for aggravated battery, the Polk County Sheriff's Polk Office County said. Is you wild. know, this makes sense now. The Sheriff's Office said deputies went looking for Johnny Yates, who was 41 years old, only to be greeted by a whiteboard with the message saying Johnny Yates <laughs> does not, in all capitals, live here. Seems legit, right? Well, deputies didn't think so. The sheriff's office said deputies saw a person leaving the home who told them that Johnny was inside with several other people. We're going to assume that Johnny was actually yeah. that person. Didn't really state. But this article for News Channel 8 on WFLA.com was the source for this. Yes. So great. Um, and I guess there's only one thing to say after that. What, what the, the Florida? Florida? <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, Josh. Well... What story are you going to tell us and our wonderful listeners today? Well, I wish I could tell you it's from Australia, just to pique your interest from down under. Down under. However, this one's <laughs> going to be from another place, not okay. in America. Okay. We're going back a little ancient for the haunting of the Valley of the Kings and the Curse of the Pharaohs. Ooh, Egyptian. I like that. I this like one it. was really exciting for me because growing up, when I would always go to like museums for school, I would always really love going to these exhibits. You always love doing that? Always love doing those exhibits. I love that. I love, love that, that for you. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Okay, How's that I'm sound? I'm ready. All right. Kids and friends and bitches, the Valley of the Kings situated along the west bank of the Nile River in Egypt, is one of the most iconic and historically significant sites in the world. For over 500 years, from the 16th to the 11th century BC, it served as the final resting place for the pharaohs and powerful nobles of the new kingdoms of ancient Egypt. This vast necropolis consists of more than 65 royal tombs hidden deep within the desert mountains, each one intricately decorated and filled with treasures and offerings for the afterlife. That would be, oh God, I want to go there. Me I want to go too. everywhere. I this is the problem is researching all this stuff. I want Why to go. does travel have to cost I go anything? <laughs> we should be just allowed like a free punch <laughs> card that Literally. the government gives us to travel the world because we're only living one time. You know, Preach. there you go. I hope one of these government officials hear that and make it a fucking bill. Anywho, the royal tombs are decorated with the traditional scenes from Egyptian mythology that reveals clues to the period's funeral practices and afterlife beliefs. Almost all the tombs seem to have been opened and robbed in antiquity, but they still give an idea of the opulence and power of ancient Egypt's pharaohs. The Valley of the Kings gained prominence during the reign of the pharaoh, and I'm, again, I'm bad with these names and words, Thutmose? 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 One hmm. is the first one of that name. We're, we're going with whatever We're going to run want, with that. Who chose that the site as his burial place in the 16th century BC. Before this, the royal tombs were constructed in the nearby Valley of the Queens and the Valley of the Nobles. However, Thutmose's decision to build his tomb in the Valley of the Kings marked a significant shift 
and Egyptian funerary practices. The pharaohs believed that being buried in a sacred location would give them closer proximity to the sun god Ra, and their journey to the afterlife would then be more successful because so. Over the next few centuries, the Valley of the Kings became the preferred burial site for the pharaohs and other members of the royal family and noble classes. Each tomb was carefully planned and constructed with elaborate chambers and intricate decorations. <laughs> wow, I said that very weird. <laughs> it I wasn't just... necessarily wrong, but it, it was... had a weird twang to you it. Did, decorations? <laughs> like four different accents there. Depicting scenes from the deceased's life and their journey to the afterlife. Many of these tombs are guarded by some otherworldly entities, mainly half animal and half human deities. The construction of these tombs required an immense number of resources, including skilled craftsmen, laborers, and materials, demonstrating the immense wealth and power of Egyptian rulers back then. The most famous and well-known tomb in the Valley of the Kings is that boy King Tutankhamun, also famously known as King Tut, who ruled during the 14th century BC. The discovery of this tomb in 1922 by British archaeologist Howard Carter sparked worldwide fascination and led to a renewed interest in ancient Egyptian history. Other notable tombs include those of Ramses II, who has 120 tombs dedicated to his son alone. Wow. That fucking bastard. <laughs> Seti I and Queen Nefertari. With each one showcasing the incredible architecture and artistic abilities of the ancient Egyptians. Have you seen much of these tombs? Oh yeah, I mean I've I've watched like a lot of stuff on like History Channel and things about it. Um, also, growing up, very interested in this kind of thing. I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated with history in general. I'm you know ner nerdy friend over here. Me so. too. And the way that they preserve <laughs> these mummies and how some of them just still look it's crazy. Insane. It really is. I, I don't. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's creepy. It's it is honestly. creepy <laughs> because they're like forever. Yeah, them. it's really weird. But despite its significance, the Valley of the Kings faced several challenges throughout history. In ancient times, many tombs were looted and destroyed by grave robbers. And even in modern times, some tombs have been damaged by tourism and weathering. However, thanks to ongoing archaeological efforts and preservation efforts, the Valley of the Kings continues to amaze and educate visitors from all over the world. However, alongside the grandeur and the historical significance of the valley, there have been numerous reports of strange occurrences and hauntings within the walls. Many archaeologists, tourists, and even local workers have reported eerie experiences and unexplained phenomena while exploring the ancient tombs. Let's hear it. Let's hear them. Let's get in. Some have claimed to hear voices and whispers in empty corridors. Others have reported seeing shadowy figures or dark pharaoh silhouettes roaming around the tombs in nearby deserts. Some have also even felt a presence or a touch from an unseen uh, entity. These occurrences have given rise to the belief that spirits of the pharaohs and their servants still linger in the valley, guarding their final resting places. The most famous story of hauntings in the Valley of the Kings is that of the curse of King Tut. It is said that anyone who disturbs the tomb of the young pharaoh will suffer a terrible fate. Soon after the discovery of the tomb, many of those involved in the excavation had actually passed away of mysterious medical causes. I remember hearing about that. Like when I was like, that's just... Well, we're going to dive into that. Yeah. But before we do, in the early 1900s, the world of archaeology was buzzing with excitement over the discovery of the tomb King Tut. At that time, King Tut was relatively an unknown pharaoh of ancient Egypt. The discovery was made by a British archaeologist named Howard Carter, who had been searching for the tomb for years with the financial backing of wealthy Lord Carnarvon. Yeah. Lord Carnarvon. 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 The search for <laughs> King Tut's tomb began in 1907 and consisted of a team of seven. Uh, let's see. A.C. Mace, A.R. Chandler, Lady Evelyn Herbert, H. Carter, Lord Carnarvon, Alfred Lucas, and Harry Burton worked tirelessly for months, carefully excavating and documenting every artifact they could find. While many people were eventually borderline obsessed with the discovery, the citizens of Egypt were not as eager for archaeologists to start their journey of the excavation. They felt that the tombs of ancient Egypt were an important part of their heritage and history and that they didn't want the tombs disturbed. The Egyptian government eventually gave the team permission to dig and excavate. So it's the government's fault that all this yeah. really started happening. Yeah. The tomb I mean, of, isn't it always? <laughs> it is. You know, and a lot of it's based on money and trying to just earn that bottom dollar. The tomb was unlike any that had been previously discovered as it was almost completely intact and undisturbed by grave robbers. As they continued to uncover the treasures of the tomb, 
the world awaited the reveal of the mysterious pharaoh. After years of unsuccessful excavations, Count of Ron was ready to give up and cut the funding um, of the project, essentially. But Carter determined to find the elusive tomb, convinced Count of Ron to give him one more session of searching. During this final session on November 9th, 1922, Carter's team stumbled upon a step in the sand that would eventually lead them to King Tut's burial chamber. Finally, on February 16th, 1923, the world got its first glimpse of the treasures of King Tut's tomb. The news of the discovery spread like wildfire and sparked a worldwide fascination with ancient Egypt. People from all over the world flocked to Egypt to witness the excavation and to see the treasures for themselves. What a time. I'm, I just, I wonder what that was like, you know? Just a fascination. It's, everyone wants to see, wants to know what's it about. Yeah. The artifacts that were found in the tomb provided a wealth of information about the ancient Egyptian culture and life during the time of King Tut's reign. The golden scar sarcophaguses adorned with intricate carvings and symbols containing the mummy of the young pharaoh, perfectly preserved for over 3,000 years. The walls of the tomb were covered in detailed paintings and hieroglyphics depicting scenes from King Tuck's life and his journey to the afterlife. Despite the astonishing discoveries, the tomb also held some challenges for Carter and his team over their six and a half year excavating journey. The ancient Egyptians believed in curses, and some people believed that opening the tomb and disturbing the mummy would bring upon disastrous consequences. This led to the rumors and superstitions surrounding the tomb and its discovery, which contributed to the fascination and intrigue surrounding King Tut's story. Howard Carter was entirely skeptical of this such curse, dismissing them as Tommy Rot and commenting that the sentiment of Egyptologists is not one of fear, but one of respect and awe, entirely opposed to foolish superstitions. In May 1926, he reported in his diary a sighting of a jackal of the same type as Anubis, the guardian of the dead. Mm. Interesting, huh? For the first time in over 35 years of working in the desert, although he did not attribute this to a supernatural cause. Oh, no, that's just normal. Right. I just saw this weird jackal, and it was just a thing. No big deal. Yeah, it was a normal animal. Lord (laughs) Garner Brown, the person who originally financed the expedition, was the first victim of the treacherous curse. It is said that he accidentally opened a mosquito bite while shaving, leading to his blood being poisoned and him dying. Well, yikes. Yeah. This occurred just five months after the tomb was opened and six weeks after the media began reporting about the mummy's curse. The curse was then thought to strike anyone associated with the disturbings of the mummy. In a chilling a chirling twist? <laughs> In a chilling twist, legend has it that Lord Carnivron died. All the lights in his house had won out, and some account that even claiming that all the lights in Cairo, the capital of Egypt, went out around the same time. Interesting. In 1925, the anthropologist Henry Field, accompanied by Breasted, visited the tomb <laughs> and recalled that was, yeah, that's what's in the research. I know. <laughs> Breasted. I know. Okay. And recalled the kindness and friendliness of Carter. He also reported how a paperweight given to Carter's friend, Sir Bruce Ingram, was composed of a mummified hand and its wrists adorned with a scarab bracelet marked, Cursed be he who moves my body. To him shall come fire, water, and pestilence. Well, soon after receiving the gift, Ingram's house burned down, followed by a flood when it was rebuilt. Nope! Not scary at all. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Another death was that mysterious and unsettling circumstances surrounding the death of American archaeologist James Henry Breasted. There it is. Breasted was presented when Carter and his team opened the tomb, but after returning home, he was met with a shocking sight. His pet canary had been devoured by a cobra. What's even more peculiarly disturbing is that the cobra was Breasted's pet and was confined in its locked cage when he left the house. In Egyptian culture, a cobra symbolizes monarchy and is often worn by kings on their headdresses as a sign of protection. Breasted had viewed this incident as an ominous sign, leaving him deeply unsettled, and sadly, James had passed away due to an infection that he contracted during his second trip to Egypt. It's still unclear if the infection was a natural event or if it had a connection with the pet cobra and the canary event. Mm. Yeah. British industrialist Joel Wolfe, who was one of the few visitors to the tomb, also fell into a coma and died. By 1929, a total of 22 people who had been involved in the original discovery of the tomb had died prematurely within seven years. Within seven years, 22 people? Seven years. And we say the seven's lucky. There's got to be something to that. Yeah, that's to what the I'm curse saying. thing, I think. I think so. Some legends say that ancient Egyptians had advanced knowledge of poisons, and it suggested that they had laced King Tut's tomb with a uranium or other deadly poison. 
The most popular working theory is that bacteria flourished in the enclosed atmosphere, but this would not really account for all those deaths. I mean, come on, 22 and seven years, come on. The expedition of Howard Carter and the discovery of King Tut's tomb had a profound impact on the field of archaeology and the world's understanding of ancient Egypt. The artifacts found in the tomb are now on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and continue to captivate and inspire people from all over the world. The story of Howard Carter and King Tut serve as a reminder of power of perseverance, passion, and the thrill of discovery and unlocking the secrets of the past. Despite scientific explanation for these occurrences, many people still believe that supernatural presence is in the valley. Some even claim to have heard the Pharaoh's voice warning them to leave the tomb or they felt a cold breath on their neck while exploring the corridors. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Just a good right on your back of your neck. (laughs) However, not all hauntings in the valley are believed to be connected to the pharaohs. According to local legend, the valley is also home to jinn, supernatural beings, and Islamic mythology. It is said that these jinn were angered by the excavation and disturbances of their resting place and they'll haunt the tombs and curse anyone who dares to even enter. So it's like doubly, doubly haunted. Nobody oh. wants to be, they don't want you in there. Stay the fuck out. <laughs> Whether these hauntings are work of the restless spirits or simply elaborate legends, the Valley of the King remains a mysterious and fascinating place. The tales of curses and supernatural occurrences only add to the allure and mystique of the ancient burial grounds, ensuring that it will continue to captivate the imagination of visitors for years to come. Let's go digging, everybody. <laughs> I don't really want to go digging, but I do want to go visit. Let's go visit and get some because, curses. Like, well, here's the thing. I feel like if you're just visiting, then you're not like just, dis- I mean, they right? <laughs> According to these curses, if you listen to my story, dear okay. friend, you don't fuck with these things. Okay, but I want to visit Egypt. Maybe just bad. some pictures. Those pictures are pretty good. And I've even seen on Facebook recently, and the little weird, I don't know if you've maybe come across this, they have 3D tours of these tombs. Really? So you can actually take your phone and put it up in the ceiling, oh. and it will show you the ceiling of that place. Really cool. I just discovered that like oh, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, you should, yeah. Coincidentally, after I did the story. Yeah, show me that. Thanks. Yeah, very cool. Really great story. I Thank loved you. it. Thank you. Yeah, it was really fun to do. You'd like to fuck me up, so I'm ready to have you do it again. Always. Um, today, I'm going to be telling everybody about the um, serial killer Donald Gaskins. Is he from Don Don He's not. Okay. He's not. We're actually staying in the U.S. All right, girl. Which I don't do very much of. Get it. Yeah, no. I do. Um, yeah, this one's a, uh, well, you know, let's, let's just get into let's it. Let's just You'll get see. in. You'll yeah. see. <laughs> so Donald Henry Gaskins was born on March 13th, 1933 in Florence County, South Carolina to Yulia Parrott. Okay. He was the last in a string of her illegitimate children. So it's. This is certain off. So he's now. cared about really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was quite small for his age as a child, which gained him the nickname Pee Wee. Oh, kids are fucking terrible, <laughs> man. Okay. Um, and I don't even. I think this is actually like his family nicknamed him this. Still, so which is worse? Which terrible. is worse? Right. Obviously, kind of. <laughs> as an adult, he was only between five four and five five, and weighed around one hundred and thirty pounds. So really, this nickname kind of fit him through his whole life. Yes. As a child, there was a great deal of neglect from his mother, and he was abused by a male relative. Okay. So. Not good. In adolescence, he was involved in a crime spree with a group of fellow delinquents. This included burglaries, assaults, and a gang rape. And by adolescence, I mean like prior to, prior to even being a teenager. So this his life really is not starting he out. He was involved in a gang rape at 13? Well, pro- it would be like prior to 13. Oh, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's bad. Okay. Now, when he was 13, Gaskins was convicted of assaulting a young girl by hitting her in the head with an axe when she caught him breaking into her home. 13. He was sentenced to five years in a reform school. He went to South Carolina Industrial School for white boys in Florence, where unfortunately he was raped regularly by fellow inmates. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not it's unclear about like a lot of timelines on, on this was unclear exactly. So at some point he escaped reform school, got married and then voluntarily returned to the school to complete a sentence. That was really kind of like a lot that I could find. Um, okay. I'm not really, I, again, it's, yeah, you Understood. know, but 
Yeah. That's what's out there. <laughs> in 1951, he was released when he was 18. In 1953, while working on a tobacco plantation, he was arrested for attacking a teenage girl with a hammer for simply insulting him. Pretty normal response. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At this time, he was sentenced to six years at the South Carolina Penitentiary. He quickly earned the respect of his fellow inmates by killing Hazel Brazel, who was the most feared man in prison at the time. He claimed it was self-defense. I mean, but this this man was not really... Um, uh, <laughs> I don't yeah, know so he's word. five. Uh, he wasn't really calm. I mean, he was definitely like crazy. So I'd like to know how big of stature Hazel was. You know, just yeah, I know. Because this, yeah, being five five and like one hundred and thirty pounds, like right. how is he even? You know, it's always the small ones that know how to maneuver. You though. know, he received an extra three years under his sentence for involuntary manslaughter for this. Now, in nineteen fifty five, he escaped from prison by hiding in the back of a garbage truck and fled to. He fucking fled to Florida. He fled to Florida. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. They all fly to the armpit of the country. Surprise, surprise. Here we are. What the Florida, you know. There he got a job working with a traveling carnival. So he was one of those skeezy carnies. (laughs) This is all sounding about right. Yeah. (laughs) Um, He was eventually rearrested, remanded to custody, and eventually paroled in 1961 because, you know, he's living this, you know, good behavior. Oh, Like, how are you? He escapes. And then he's paroled, like, I, I don't, I mean, I don't understand it. But. Oh, our country, yeah. And especially back then, it, it was very loose. Things things were very loose back then. I, I had a your mom joke, but I love your mom so much. <laughs> but I'm not, you, I mean, you can all put it together. Sherry, yeah. I love you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, bear. <laughs> I was thinking it too, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> pretty much immediately upon release, he began... Co- be- began <laughs> committing burglaries and fencing stolen property. So he just went right into being shitty again, you know? I do. Now, two years after his parole, he was arrested for raping a 12-year-old girl. This, I'm going to beat the shit I hate out him. of this motherfucker. Okay, yeah. But he ran off while awaiting his sentence. He was found and rearrested in Georgia, and this time sentenced to eight years in prison. Do you think... And nobody's learning a fucking lesson here. I mean, do you think he... Um, Served all his time? No. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, in November 1968, he was paroled again. Fuck this bitch. Again. So this time he moved to Sumter, South Carolina, and found work with a roofing company. His first non-prison related victim was a blonde female hitchhiker whom he tortured and murdered in September 1969 before sinking her body in a swamp. She would be the first of many hitchhikers that he picked up and killed while driving around the coastal highways of the American South. Gaskins classified these victims as coastal kills, people whom he killed purely for pleasure around every six weeks or so. These consisted of both men and women. He tortured and mutilated his victims while attempting to keep them alive as long as possible, which is terrible. Yeah. He claims to have killed these victims in several different ways, including stabbing, suffocation, and mutilation. He even admitted to cannibalizing some of them. He later confessed to killing 80 to 90 in this way, but this has never been fully cooperated, like the number, so. For sure. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to get into murders that we definitely know about, um, that are not in the 80 to 90 alleged, so. I'm I'm ready to (laughs) hear about... Those. In November 1970, he committed the first of a series of murder murders, mostly people he knew and killed for personal reasons. His first confirmed victims were his own niece, Janice Kirby, who was 15, and her friend, Patricia Allsbrook, who was 17. I would love to know the reasoning for that He one. beat both of them to death. Uh, it didn't really, again, I, I don't, I'm not really I mean, sure about, one, but there's not a, really a good reason, and this guy was terrible. In either March 1971 or 1972, Gaskins poisoned Martha Dix Jr., which it's she's a woman and the, a junior behind her name kind of was weird, but that is that is a thing. Remember in the Madame LaLaurie story yeah, episode Yeah, that's three? right. That's right. That yeah. Has, yeah. So, there was two, two daughters with the same name. Yeah. yeah. Just the, the tack junior on it, though. Like, I mean, anyway, that was weird that's funny. Now, there was a rumor going around that Pee Wee was the father of her child. And this could have caused his rage, but again, nothing has been substantiated. 
Her bones were found in a ditch, but were lost when they were given to a university to study. All right. In June 1973, he raped and drowned both Doreen Dempsey, who was 22, and her two-year-old daughter, Robin. He raped the two-year-old daughter? That's... What the fuck, man? That's how it was written. Disgusting. Mm -hmm. He had befriended Doreen a few years earlier and was angry that she had become pregnant a second time by an African-American man. So this was his justification. He was... He was also racist on top of being just a terrible person in general. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, the worst. In June of 1974, Gaskins shot his friend, Johnny Sellers, age 36, in the back of the head and stabbed to death Johnny's ex-girlfriend, Jesse Rudy, age 22, after Sellers asked for money he was owed from the sale of a stolen boat. So this is, this is is these are like the reasons. And <laughs> basically it's, he owes people money or whatever. And he's like, you know what? Instead of paying you, I'm going to just fucking kill you. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, in February of 1975, he murdered Silas Yates, age 45, by slitting his throat with a knife. Yates was in a dispute with his ex-girlfriend, Suzanne Kipper Owens, and she and her husband had actually paid Gaskins $1,500 to murder Yates. And in today's money, that would have been about eight hundred. dollars $8,865. Still not worth it. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Now on April 10th, 1975, he stabbed Diane Bellamy, 25, to death and shot dead her boyfriend, Avery Howard, who was 34. He murdered Diane because she had threatened to report to police that Gaskins had been allowing underage teenagers to have sex at his home. Avery was murdered because Gaskins was afraid that he would report his criminal activities to the police. So again, we're just, he's covering his ass. So he's just on a, he is just murdering anybody who he can. Uh (laughs) Sometime in 1975, he stabbed Kim Galkins to death to keep her from telling police that she was being sexually abused by Gaskins and several other adult men. She was only 13 years old. Terrible. On October 10th, 1975, Gaskins shot Dennis Bellamy, age 27, and John Knight, age 15, who were half-brothers, both in the back of the head. They were also the brothers of Diane Bellamy, who he had murdered previously. Sure. Um, And yeah, so anyway, he had promised to pay Dennis Bellamy for some stolen guns. Instead of doing that, he lured both men into the woods behind his house and murder them. Oh, so yeah. okay. you know, instead yeah. of paying up his sure. his debts. <laughs> now Gaskins was arrested on November fourteenth, nineteen seventy five, when a criminal associate named Walter Neely confessed to police that he had knowledge that Gaskins killed Dennis Bellamy and Johnny Knight. Neely told police that Gaskins had confided in him that he'd killed several people over the course of the previous five years, and indicated where they were buried. On December 4th, 1975, police went to some land near Gaskin's home in Prospect where they discovered the bodies of eight of his victims. Just eight. Oh, Mm -hmm. terrible. All like shallow shallow graves. Yeah, and I'm glad that this uh, Neely came forward and confessed because who knows? There would have been no end to this, you know? Right. Gaskin's was tried on one charge of murder for killing Dennis Bellamy on May 24th, 1976 and found guilty on May 28th and was sentenced to death by electric chair. Good. Well, oh. in 1978, that death sentence was overturned Are you fucking kidding me? by the South Carolina Supreme I spoke Court. Too goddamn soon. <laughs> <laughs> now, rather than face a new trial, Gaskins pled guilty to the murders of Bellamy and eight others. He was given 10 concurrent life sentences to be served at Central Correctional Institution Prison in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, I know we're upset about it being commuted, whatever, but at least he was get, he 10 concurrent life sentences is, is a pretty solid. It's pretty solid. I guess. But the story's not over. Okay. It's not over. <laughs> now, while he was there in prison, he murdered fellow inmate Rudolph Tyner on September 2nd, 1982. Tyner was 23 and was on death row for a March 1978 murder. He had been convicted of robbing a murals inlet convenience store and killing store owners Bill and Myrtle Moon. I think Myrtle Moon is a really great name, by the way. That is a nice moon. Nice moon. Yeah, Myrtle Moon. I love it. Anyway, 
The moon's son, Tony Simo, hired Gaskins for $2,000 to kill Tyner. Gaskins told Simo to insert some C4 explosive inside the heel of a shoe and mail it to him. What? And he was able to use this to kill Tyner. What the hell? Like, yeah, it's crazy. Now we have to get that creative. I mean. What the fuck? Now, after his conviction, he received a second death sentence. So, okay. Okay. So we're back. Death is back on the table. You should be happy about it. <laughs> okay. Now, this was the first time in the history of South Carolina that a white man was sentenced to death for the murder of a black man. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, now, this murder earned him the title Meanest Man in America. So that's what he's known as. All right. And you know what? I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> yeah. Now, while on death row... Gaskins claimed to have committed somewhere between 100 and 110 murders. These statements have been discredited by law enforcement and journalists who allege this was just an attempt to gain more no- notoriety. There has never been any evidence to substantiate his statements. Now, I don't know. I'm kind of, I kind of believe it. Uh... And I don't know, maybe not 100 to 110, but... I think that like, because he, okay, so he was doing the, his other, he, okay, there's like 12 to 15 that they know about. Okay. Then he's got his coastal killings. I mean, you have to think even if like all of them weren't true, you know, he was doing that. So like doing, picking up the hitchhikers That's and just stuff, crazy so. though. Think like how busy do you have to be killing people? People have done it, man. It's crazy. I know. And then still live a normal life or a seemingly normal life. Yeah. That, I would, you know, man, I, I just have so many thoughts going on. Yeah. But the number one is that I'm glad that motherfucker died, right? Well, here we go. We're oh. going to talk about that. Or does he come back to life with witchy powers? <laughs> and you always... Fortunately, no. Okay, good. <laughs> so Gaskins was executed okay. on September 6, 1991 at 1 10 a.m. in the electric chair. Oh. Hours before, he tried to kill himself by slitting his wrist with a razor he had smuggled into his cell by swallowing it days earlier. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. His last words were, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go. He was 58 years old. Holy shit. And that is the story of serial killer Donald Gaskins. What a fucking psycho, man. They all are. They all, all are. But know? it's like they're they're all the same psycho and in the all different in the same fucking mm-hmm. yeah so there you go <sighs> man we need more fucking psychotherapists to psychoanalyze these crazy fucks literally great job Thanks. that one again fucked me <laughs> up thank you my story on the valley of the kings and it's haunting are the express.com's article on king tut in its tomb pen.museum's article on the curse of the pharaohs and i have two wikipedia articles one on the curse of the pharaohs and one on the valley of the kings and my sources for donald gaskins was the wikipedia article about him and an article from investigationdiscovery.com and the rest of our sources will be in our show notes yes they will oh man what a great episode we've had today we have i've really enjoyed it um i love all of our listeners Thank you. You continue to support us and help us grow. And every one of you that follow us, review, give us feedback and just spend time listening. We really do appreciate it. We really are appreciated. And we really love like hearing the feedback from people. Like even if it's good, you know, we love hearing that too. Yeah. We love it. I mean, if you want to, we like attention. I mean, if you want to compliment me, I'm not going to say no. Yeah, please do. Um, But what else I would really need you to know. Oh, please tell it. Is that mystery never sleeps. And neither do we. Bye, Bye, bitch. Humor, haunts, and homicide.